Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and we've been talking about Abraham, how he looked for a city that was a community, a heavenly community, yet also on earth, beginning to be built. Um, and we've been talking a lot about covenant and how community is covenantal. We're going to keep talking about that today, but specifically about oaths, that covenants are actually a bloody business. In uh, scripture, in numerous places, the Psalms come to mind. Uh, when God wants to describe his covenant, he often simply says, my oath, as if that settles it, as if we will all understand. Unfortunately, in the 21st century, most of us don't know what an oath is. Uh, we probably go two directions with it. Uh, some kind of oath of office thing. We, maybe we've heard mm. it. People re reaching their hand toward the sky and promising they're going to do something, like tell the truth or fulfill an office. Or we think in terms of evil sorts of swearing, where you blaspheme <laughs> God or take his name in vain. There are parts of the Christian church that think that oaths are completely out. Jesus said, swear not at all. And ignoring the much larger context of scripture, they say, well, then no kind of oath is valid. We will simply be people of our word, which is kind of what Jesus was after there anyway, be people <laughs> of your word, and you shouldn't have to be swearing very often. But the nature of an oath is to call God as judge and to ask God in his capacity of, as judge of the universe to evaluate our performance. I say, I will do this. If I did this, then may God smile upon the fact that I did what I said. And if I didn't, may God release his wrath against me in one form or another. Uh, and we're going to look at some specific instances in scripture of, of oath taking. One side note, the one organization in the 20th century, in the 19th century, <laughs> that still took oaths seriously was something we call Freemasonry. The whole society was built upon a sort of pyramid scheme of uh, initiation levels. And at each level, the initiate was required to take an oath, swearing complete secrecy concerning any new thing he might learn, and complete faithfulness to his superiors. Uh, here's one of the versions. I forget which level this is from. The Mason is to swear, binding myself under no less a penalty than of having my throat cut across, my tongue torn out, and with my body buried in the sands of the sea at low water mark. Which means when the tide came in, you get to drown over and over again. Very bloody, and most of the Masonic oaths are that way. You ask a good Mason today about that, they'll probably say, oh, it's just, it's just allegory. We don't mean it. Nobody takes that seriously. Once upon a time, people took it quite seriously. And a side note, not quite li uh, rising to the level of a recommendation yet. There is a book, I believe the title is um, Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution by Stephen Knight, I think was his name, uh, that connects the the bizarre brutalities of Jack the Ripper to the exact formatting of Masonico's. So something for those I was wondering are... if Jack the Ripper was going to come up <laughs> this evening. <laughs> of course. For those of you who are interested in such bizarre things, you might check that out. But let us turn our attention back to Scripture, and we're going to go to a passage in Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah 34. And what's happening here is that the city is under siege, just as the days of Jeremiah and Zedekiah the king. Nebuchadnezzar's armies are without. Jerusalem does not have a whole lot of time left. But in an effort to get at least a little bit of a favor from the Lord, they, the people of Jerusalem, agree to let go their seven-year-long indentured servants, which is only what the law required. And to punctuate the fact that they're going to do this, they make a special covenant with God. And Jeremiah describes it like this, or God does. I will give the men that have transgressed my covenant, which have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me, when they cut the calf in twain, in two, and pass between the parts thereof, the princes of Judah, the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs and the priests, and all the people of the land, 
which passed between the parts of the calf. I will even give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of them that seek their life. And their dead bodies shall be for meat unto the fowls of heaven and to the beasts of the earth. So the people of Jerusalem made this promise, this commitment, this cut this covenant before God, didn't keep it, and God is telling them what's going to happen to them. But the form God describes in passing is they cut a calf in half, and all of the people who were taking the oath upon themselves, uh, who were swearing to the covenant, passed between it, saying, in effect, if I do not keep this covenant, then maybe I may I be torn in pieces, and may my body be fed to the beast of the field, the fowls of heaven, which is exactly what God says is going to happen. So it's a very bloody, very literal, very judicial kind of affair. Uh, at this point, we should introduce the word self-maledictory. Maledictory, malice is the Latin word for evil. Dicto, dictere, dixi, dictum uh, is the Latin verb for speaking. So very simply, to speak evil of oneself, to look at God and say, I will do this. And if I don't, this is what I am asking you or expecting you to do to me. Taking God very, very, very seriously. This is a, a concept that the modern church has nearly lost any kind of vision of. And so when we stumble across God's covenant with Abraham, as is described in Genesis 15, we're often at a loss. What's going on here? And what does it all mean? Now, you've already set things up for us, Emily. You've described... Of course, we've seen that God made a promise to Abraham, that Abraham believed the promise. It was counted to him for righteousness. God confirmed the promise. Again, we're told, and Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. But in that context, then, Abraham says, well, yeah, you just told me I'm going to inherit the land, but how will I know that I will inherit it? And I think most of us would some degree of arrogance, say, well, God just said so. Why don't you shut up and listen? <laughs> but God, God doesn't do that. He says, all right, you want, you want more confirmation. I will give you more confirmation. And here's what God says to him. Uh, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit? He said, take me an heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another, but the birds he divided not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that's not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards they shall come out with great substance, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace, even a burning lamp, passed between those pieces. In the selfsame day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed... Have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Kevinites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Gergeshites and the Jebusites. And thus the account ends. And so we're invited to, I think, to get into the mind of Abram. He's, he's asked God for confirmation and God says, all right, cut these animals in pieces and lay them out. What secular archaeology has shown us is that many of the nations around about, about that time, or at least shortly thereafter, adopted cut, covenant cutting ceremonies like this. So Abram would have known about this. He would have understood what was going on. And what would normally happen is that a sojourn, a, a sovereign, a lord, would say to a vassal, hey, you're going to be my special pal. Here's the deal. Here's the, here's the stipulations. Here's what you're going to swear to. And uh, I've laid out these... Um, divided animals for you, and you're going to walk this bloody path and take this oath upon you, swearing that you will be absolutely faithful to me, or all these horrible things will happen to you. This Abraham would have known. And so as Abraham is looking there in expectation, no doubt as a humble man, wondering, how am I ever going to live up to the holiness of God? Things get worse. 
darkness descends, horror comes upon him. Think of Calvary here. And he can't move. He can't do anything. It, it was bad enough already, and now he's paralyzed. It's dark. He can't see. He's afraid. He's terrified. And then suddenly the Shekinah glory appears, and God walks the bloody path, taking upon himself the curse. We're not told how Abraham responded to that. I'm not <laughs> sure how any of us exactly would respond to that one. I don't think he saw it coming. It doesn't matter. What matters is that God swears by his own life that rather than let his promise to Abraham fail, he will find a way to take upon himself the curses of the covenant. Now, on the one hand, you could say, well, God can't die. So, well, then that means the covenant can't fail, right? Or, more likely, God will find a way to die to uphold the covenant. And in there, the Bible has more to say about covenants and our obligations and all that. But this follows upon the promise. The promise is absolute. It's a matter of faith. This is a confirmation and a structure of the promise. And then only after that does God say, oh, and by the way, since you're you're my son and my servant, since we're in a covenant together, here's some things you got to do. But those things don't in and of themselves put you in the covenant, nor do they bring righteousness or the gift of the Spirit. And when we turn that order around, we get into a lot of trouble. One thing I noticed in this passage was the specific animals mm. that God commands to be offered, the heifer, the she-goat, the ram, the turtle dove, and a young pigeon. I recognize the recognize those as different types of offerings that would be offered later in the tabernacle, especially for different people's levels of wealth. Like if they couldn't bring a lamb, they right. brought a pigeon. Is that indicating some sort of all-encompassingness of these offerings, or is there something else going on? Uh, I have seen a few things written along these lines, not enough to certainly be an expert in all the nuances here, but I think you're you're essentially right. These are the five sacrificial animals that we run into in Leviticus. We've got the cow, heifer, oxen thing. We've got a goat, this time specifically a she-goat. We've got the ram, which is a male lamb. Um, and we've got the turtle dove and the pigeon. Those are the five animals that will be accepted on the altar for sacrifice. And you're also quite right in the purification ceremonies, what the King James calls a sin offering, Everyone in a different status in society was to offer a particular sort of animal equivalent to their rank, whether you were a prince or a priest or a commoner or whether it was the whole nation together. And again, I don't have that list memorized. So it would be interesting to to compare and see if there's a parallel. Certainly pigeons and doves were often used for the poorest of God's people and the heifer and the oxen for some of the wealthier so I think you're right. I think I think at least part of what's going on here, and there, and there may be much more, is that it's taking in all that the altar is going to do, and it's going to, it's taking in all of God's people of all sorts and all classes. I think it's a very fine observation. I will point out also that we we look at this and we say, "What? Well, but wait, where's Jesus? Well, he's here. <laughs> First of all, he's the God who's walking through the slain animals. Secondly, he's represented by the slain animals." But there's a couple other things. He, God says, I'm giving this land to your seed. Mm -hmm. When we come to the book of Galatians, and, and Paul wants to specify who the seed is, he doesn't just say, the seed's Christ. He quotes Genesis and says, unto thy seed, and which seed is Christ. Unto is there. And every time there's an unto thy seed, it's talking about the land grant. What God is, not just that there will be a seed who will do something marvelous, but God is giving this specific land to Jesus. In Isaiah, we find this land called Emmanuel's land on a couple of occasions. Mm -hmm. And so what, is, what, does this have all, what does this have to do to Messiah? Well, Messiah is going to come to earth. He's got to come to someplace specific. Geography is actually a relevant thing at this point. Um, the uh, the pagan myths and, and Gnostic meditations may be content with a Messiah who exists in ether space or something, but God is promising a flesh and blood person who's going to come and stand on real ground. And 
God's telling Abraham, pretty frankly, here's the ground. Uh, this land becomes important not because it has any magical properties, not because uh, the people who live there, Israel, is going to be all that holy a people, not because of some future millennial kingdom, but for the very practical place that when Messiah lands, he's got to land someplace, and <laughs> and this is this is going to be it. And God even uh, stretches out a timetable. Abraham's going to die. You're going to have a nice long life, and then he's going to die. His descendants are going to serve another nation for 400 years. It doesn't specify that it's Egypt, but that's who he has in mind. And at the end of that time of oppression, which starts, I would argue, with the with Ishmael, who's an Egyptian, mocking Isaac, once they are fully in that land, which will be sometime later, after fourth generation, they're going to come back. At that point, the iniquity of the Amorites will be full, and then God's people are going to inherit this land, and they're going to be there to prepare for the coming of Messiah. So where is Jesus? Woven in and out of this whole passage. Uh, and so as we look back and remember that, first of all, we have the promise, in thee and thy seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Paul calls that a preaching of the gospel, by which he means that it's justification by faith and that it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. And all nations blessed means that Abraham's looking for a worldwide and international, a Catholic community of all sorts of people. And now God says, and I'm framing this covenant thing, whereupon I am guaranteeing this with my own life, a place for this all to start. It's, it's going to be a geographical place, a real land, a real part of, the, of our world, where God will set up his people and they will, and he doesn't tell them how long, but they will be preparing for the coming of the Messiah. So all of this, we're moving through history, we're moving through geography, but we're moving toward Messiah. And so we leave chapter 15. Chapter 16 is um, the lapse of Abram and, and Sarah, Sarai into a compromised unbelief. They, it's not that they don't believe the promise. They just think God needs help. Sarah's too <laughs> old. And so we... And if you don't understand this about Abram and Sarah, you miss everything. Some people just look at this and said, hey, Abraham saw this, this cute girl. He wanted to check out the younger model. It was his lust kicking in. That's the last thing that's happening here. First of all, it's Sarah's idea. But he goes along. He's responsible for his decisions. But what they want is the fulfillment of the promise. They want the Messiah to come. And Sarah, and apparently Abram too, look at Sarah's body and say, no, oh, that ain't happening. And so, well, this younger woman, you can have children by her in a very natural way, and then I can adopt the baby, it'll be mine, and that's I'm sure that's what God intends. Well, that wasn't what God intended, and this he eventually <laughs> makes very clear. And again, Paul and Galatians spend a lot of time talking about it, and it sort of becomes one of his major themes, is the gospel, God does his part, and then we help him along with the rest. No, it's not. Grace is sovereign. And after that, we come to chapter 17, where God again appears to Abram. Abram was 90 years old and nine. The Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. Mature, complete. Well, now, that's also rather challenging. <laughs> but he does, yeah. How would you feel if God said, hi, I'm God. Now, you're going to be perfect from here on out. Uh, but we find out that that's not exactly, our idea of perfection isn't exactly what God is talking about, because he immediately says some other things. I will make my covenant between me and thee and multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and has God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. Thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful. I will make nations of thee. Kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed, there it is again, after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, 
which you shall get between me and you and, the, and thy seed after thee. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall, circ uh, you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Uh, he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man-child in your generations. He that's born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that's born in thy house and he that is bought with money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from my people. He hath broken my covenant. And then Sarah asks, or Abram asks, it's now Abraham, ask about Sarai, and her name gets changed to Sarah, and Ishmael gets sidetracked, but not forgotten or overlooked. Um, but the covenant will be with Isaac, the covenant line. So here we have uh, what Paul calls a sign and seal of God's covenant with Abraham, or more specifically, a sign and seal of the righteousness of faith. And so we again come back to this, this thing that God will not let us forget. There's nothing we can do to prime the fountain of God's grace, to drag God down out of heaven and pour him into a cup. Uh, we have no wand of magical conversion. Uh, there is no ceremony or rite that can uh, force God's hand and make him save our spouse, our friend, our child. This is God's sovereign grace. And he this this sign, which God again by metonymy calls his covenant. It's it's so important that the covenant is in a sense, not in all senses, wrapped up in this act. When I'm talking to my my high school students, I generally will pull off my wedding ring and say, Look, what's this? That's a wedding ring. Yeah, you're right. Very good. Where'd I get this? Your wife gave it to you. That's right. I gave her a ring too. Now, what this, this ring came, the one that I'm wearing came from, from my wife. So when she gave me that ring, what was she saying? Well, she's saying that she's going to be your wife and that she's going to promise to live with you after God's commandments. Well, and actually, then, it means <laughs> that you're <laughs> going to have to belong to her and be faithful to her, right? Isn't well, it it's, but it comes, to, it comes to her <laughs> as her promise to me, first of all, because okay. she's the one who has the ring. Now, I was, I was about oh, to say, yeah. I, I was okay. about to say I didn't buy the I ring. I got it backwards. I, yeah, that's what's tricky here. And too often, uh, American evangelicals are guilty of that. The trick is when she gives me the ring, it's her promise to me. But when I put it on and wear it, and show it around town, I am now accepting that role and I'm showing to everybody, I belong to this woman over here. And the same thing with the ring I gave her. It is first of all, my promise to her, my invitation to her, my claim upon her. And then when she puts it on, she is agreeing, she's receiving it. And as she wears her ring, she too is saying, I'm married to this guy over here, back off guys. And it's important that we see for instance, here in circumcision, where does the sign and seal come from? Well, God gives the sign and seal. Yes, mm -hmm. we receive it. Yes, these children and these believers received it. But it was God, again, preaching them, preaching to them the gospel. Well, what's the, how is the gospel involved in this <clears throat> embarrassing thing that, you know, in our school when the first year I was there and we were um, trying to straighten out our Bible curriculum, the question of teaching younger children about circumcision actually came up. And some of the teachers, or at least a couple, were a little awkward, a little embarrassed. And, and later on, some so were some of the parents. How can you teach that to small children? In an agrarian society, this would not be a problem. But <laughs> apparently, you don't talk to your children about the birds and bees until they're 12. Um, we generally just say, if you don't know what circumcision... Go ask your parents. You know, you know, we throw it back on the parents. We don't get into into gross details, but we we assume your your children are supposed to be reading the Bible, supposed to be reading it to them. It's in Genesis. You should have hit it by now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it involves a ceremony where the baby is is cut. Some our kindergarten teacher, the first year she taught us, she taught with great enthusiasm. Great teacher, wonderful lady. 
but she was trying to figure out how to do this. And she just, she would, well, there was this ceremony where you cut the baby. And every time she did, she brought her knife hand down on her leg. So they cut the baby. So they cut the baby. And so the next day when she asked, so what is circumcision? Oh, it's when they cut the baby's leg. No, it's not. <laughs> anyway, but we do have to ask, I mean, why there? Why cut that part? Why cut, why cut the, the male reproductive organ? Well, that's the organ that brings forth children. And what God is saying here is that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Uh, there's no hope in natural generation. These children will not be saved because they are our children. We cannot impart spiritual life to them. We are dead by nature. We, in, we impart spiritual death. We bring forth sinners into the world. And if there's going to be any hope, this flesh, which is under judgment, needs regeneration rebirth. We need to be born again. And ultimately, the seed, the Messiah, the Savior, will be born outside of normal channels of reproduction. Points to the virgin birth and to the incarnation of the Son of God. But in the meantime, this we, we are reminded under the older covenant that uh, sin is a bloody business. The flesh is under judgment. And yes, it's private and yes, it's personal. And so God, God would have that gospel written into the very flesh of every professing adult who came as an adult to the faith, and in every child from eight years or male child from eight years old and up. And to be blunt, every time eight days, eight days. I'm sorry. Every time yeah. um, a male would um, use the bathroom, he would be reminded that there is no hope in the flesh. Every time a man made love to his wife, he's going to be reminded. There's no hope in the flesh. God needs to save me. God needs to save my children. And ultimately, God needs to save us all by someone who is not simply one of us. So God takes what he has already sworn, and he writes it in flesh and blood in these children of Abraham. It's a very profound thing. And it does speak of it does speak of blood and judgment. Now it doesn't save, but it preaches the gospel. And when God preaches the gospel, we can have great hope that He's planning to do exactly what He said: circumcise the hearts of our children. Uh, and we need to steer, to use the philosophical terms, away from uh, nominalism on the one hand that says this is just that this is just a symbol. It's not that important. We in practice could ignore it because, I mean, it doesn't really do anything. And the other side, philosophical realism, where, yeah, you do the ceremony, you get the reality. And we're talking covenantal thinking. God places a legal claim on these children. They are his. Can they apostatize? Yes, they can. But until that time comes, we are to treat them as members of the external covenant of the visible church. We're to include them in our worship, we're to pray for them, teach them the word of God, teach them to pray themselves toward God as their father, uh, trusting that God will save them, because all these externals, as precious as they are, won't. Mm -hmm. As I've been reading through through the Old Testament, I'm trying to stick with a read the Bible in a year plan this year for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. I've read the Bible cover to cover, but not in a year. So that's what I'm trying to do this year. And one thing that struck me on this read through was how many times the children of Abraham neglected the sign. You have Moses mm. not circumcising his sons and God comes and is going to kill him because he's neglected yeah. this. And his wife has to come in and do the surgery <laughs> and say, a bloody <laughs> husband you are to me. And again, after the wanderings in the desert, um, you know, 40 years where the sign was not observed. Yeah. And there's just this pattern of we're going to, that that that's probably, you know, allegorical, metaphorical. God didn't mean <laughs> actually flesh and blood. Boy, would that be awkward. <laughs> so. And yet when it's time for them to cross Jordan with Passover coming on, they, they do go across. They're right in Jericho's, the Canaanites' backyard, and they submit to circumcision and for a number of days, they are basically, um, what would the medical term be, in a lot of pain, <laughs> incapacitated. Yeah. Not prepared uh, for battle. Not prepared for battle. They had to trust that God would take care of them because this 
this rite, this symbol, which acknowledged their membership in God's covenant, was more important in their relationship to God than sharpening their swords. They, they had to have things right with God because they are part of a spiritual war, uh, the wars of Yahweh, whereby God is on the march, and really for about the first time in, in human history, in addition to his own sovereign power and the angelic host and, and what we call the forces of nature, his, his providential command over all the elements, he's including people with swords and spears and shields. People get to be part of his army. Uh, and this won't be for always. We don't today, as the people of God, normally take up swords and spears or machine guns and atomic bombs to fight the battles of the Lord. We fight on other terms. Mm. But this was a great privilege, and it would be easy to think that the most important thing is to have my sword ready, when in fact the most important thing at that point for them was to be circumcised and to partake of the Passover, to be faithful to the covenant, to go on acknowledging their formal covenant with God, and then to renew it in their covenant meal, the Passover. This is this is what's important. And it's also, since uh, part of the covenant that was made with Abraham concerned the actual boundaries of the land that mm. they were going to go claim, <laughs> yes. it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to ignore your own obligation in that covenant when you're about to go and lay claim to it in, in uh, his power. Yeah, but don't we yeah. do that a lot? Isn't we do that, that a of, lot. <laughs> <laughs> we're, the, we're these special cool people that God really likes for, you know, because we're Christians or we're Presbyterians or Baptists or Lutherans or we're German or English or we're Scots or we're Elder Dwarves or whatever, you know, and um, <laughs> we're Americans. Um, mm. And um, yeah, God's God's always been on our side because we've kind of always been on his and... Uh, we're going to go to the right thing, and no doubt God will bless us. We'll, we'll, we'll say a prayer to along the way. It's not like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, can you imagine them coming, you know, failing in their battles, losing their battles, having their brethren slain, and coming to God and saying, you promised this land to us, and God saying, well... You had something you were supposed to do, didn't you? The, did you read the rest <laughs> of the promise that I gave to you? It's kind of all bound up together in this covenant, this one promise. I think, Emily, in the notes that you did send us, I am now recalling an excellent point you made, that we, we need to distinguish between God's oath, whereby he takes the responsibility for the covenant upon himself, and the oath he imposes by circumcision. Mm -hmm. Because in circumcision... They, the, the God's people are acknowledging their, their unity, their incorporation into their solidarity with the seed, with the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Salvation's in him. He is Yahweh come in the flesh to take the curse upon himself. Uh, that's not something we're asked to do. We are asked simply to be in him. And the whole message of circumcision is God will pour out his spirit. God will circumcise your heart. Um, the, the assumptions are all positive. And yet there's still that hint of blood. It is possible that you will apostatize, that you will not believe. I was reading one author uh, earlier today who I won't name. A lot of what he says about the covenant is really good. But I noticed that when he got here and began talking about this, rather than saying that God requires faith, he was one of the first, I think, to start saying God requires faithfulness. Oof. Well, God does require faithfulness, but... Let's let's talk about what requires means and what faithfulness is. And in what context? Uh, and in what context? Yeah, you know, what God requires is faith in the promise. And if we miss that, we uh, try reading Genesis and not understanding that. I, I remember <laughs> um, my uh, my home church as a kid. Uh, the pastor got us all together as a congregation reading the Bible. And we started strangely enough in Genesis, and there was old one one old patriarch of, the, of a very large family who uh, came up to me and said it. Uh, these guys, these guys we're reading about, why are we reading about them? They're all a bunch of scoundrels. <laughs> and he's talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <laughs> News never flash, really, sinners. Yeah, he never really read the Bible before. And I get really tired of people picking on Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Like, um, and you're so much superior in your law-keeping, <laughs> really? 
I mean, I think it's one of the greatest, most encouraging things in the world that the father of all who believe stumbled the moment God made a covenant with him. <laughs> How great is that? If he said, and Abraham never sinned another sin in his whole life. <laughs> uh, that's not encouraging. That's not no. helpful. Uh -oh. No. But as I said before, what determined, what made Abraham Abraham was his faith, even in his sins. He sinned in terms of his faith. He wanted the promise. He just wanted to speed it up. Um, and, and as we... If I can jump in yeah. on that, kind of take a tangent there, that God's promise to Abraham was a child. And this child was to come in the context of marriage. That's how children come. Abraham right. had a wife. Yes. Like it was pretty <laughs> obvious the course that he was supposed to follow. I think polygamy... Nowadays, people think, oh, that was Old Testament. It was okay then. No, it was not. <laughs> it was like, not okay. Which is only hammered home by the multiple that. times yeah. the polygamy complicated everything and right. you know, ruined people. Yeah. yeah. It, uh, every now and then I'll try to remember to count up all the cases of polygamy in the <laughs> Old Testament. And we, you, I mean, you have Abraham, you have Jacob. <laughs> Um, you have Elkanah. That didn't go well. Mm -hmm. um, that's um, Samuel's dad. And then you start hitting the kings of Judah and Israel. None of that goes well. Including David, no. the man after Including God's David. own heart. <laughs> yeah. And we look and we say, man after God's own heart, father of all believe, of all that believe, how is this possible? And this is where we need to distinguish faith and faithfulness. Faith is the heart conviction that God's promise is good. And I need that promise exactly because I can never live up to what his law demands of me. Uh, and, and even in my sins, in my holiness, I will sin. And in my sins, there will be some reflection of holiness. It's the weirdest thing in the world. Uh, a Christian can do something really horrible. And yet that, that faith will irrationally insert some reference to Christ or to human love or to kindness or to something, we can't get away from being Christians. And so while God demands faithfulness, the faithfulness is the ongoing growth and flowering of our faith. But you step into the life of any Christian at a given moment, you are not going to find any kind of faithfulness that measures <laughs> up to anything that God requires. So sure, God wants faithfulness. He wants a fullness of faith that outpours itself in the fruit of the spirits and in practical obedience to his law. But it is the faith in the Messiah that justifies and that sanctifies. And also something else I'd like to just tangentially comment on is Abraham's sin was at base trying to add on to the work of God. It was yeah. <laughs> entirely trying to fulfill the promise made by God, not by virtue of his faith in the promise, but by a type of faithfulness. He says, yes. I need to do something to make yeah. this work out. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Yeah. And that, again, this is Galatians, as I think you all know, is one of my favorite books in the Bible. I heard my pastor, Pastor Powell, preach through it when I think I was a teenager. Uh, and it really spoke to me and struck with me and has stayed with me ever since because this is exactly the point of Galatians. Most people look at it as a defense of justification by faith, which it is, but that's only part of it because the, the, the Judaizers were saying not that you need works to be justified, but that you need works to receive the fullness of the Spirit. You can come to Christ in faith and have your sins forgiven and you'll go to heaven, but if you really want the fullness of the gospel, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, if you want God's real blessings for you here and now, then there's something you have to add. In their case, it was circumcision. The modern church has all kinds of other things that you have to do. But there's Small an groups. acknowledgement. Sorry? Small groups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Among many, many other yeah. things. 
can become a addition. It is not always a bad thing to require members of your church to attend small groups. Disclaimer from halting towards Zion. <laughs> Nor is it wrong to recommend prayer and consistent Bible reading. Emily is not in danger of losing her salvation because she's going to be reading through the Bible once a year now. Nor oh, I, I didn't say for years to come. I just said I wanted to do it. <laughs> if I make it through this nor, year, I'll be happy. <laughs> nor am I spiritually superior to her because I've been doing that for a very long time. Um, and, and actually, it really it's does. interesting that you mentioned that specifically because there's a major figure in the vaguely reformed Calvinist world who recently tweeted out that, you know, you should be reading your Bible every day because your salvation depends on it. Oh, gosh. What a horrible thing to say. <laughs> exactly. Well, now, here's, here, here's the thing. Uh, grammar nerd takes over. What's the <laughs> on it? What's the, it? <laughs> mm. the salvation, our salvation does depend on the Bible and the message contained It depends on the therein. Bible. Mm. Exactly. Not on my now, reading of it. <laughs> not on my reading of it every day. Uh, and I've... The for, problem is I doubt well, he meant it in that very nuanced way. Well, <laughs> not knowing who you're talking about, I don't know. Um, it's not my desire to but, throw stones at this particular <laughs> Uh Yeah, we want to encourage people to read the Bible. We want them to pray, probably more than less. But this is something between God and the individual and something that grows the more we, the more we hear the gospel, read the gospel, the more we talk to God about the gospel the more normally our faith will grow, the more of the Spirit's work and fruit we'll see in ourselves. And then it's a self-feeding loop, which of course can be derailed by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And this is the Christian life. So again, to step into anyone's life at some point arbitrarily and say, all right, we're going to we're gonna take the temperature of your faithfulness right now is a frightening, uh, horrifying thing. Because even on a good day, we all know that there are thoughts, there are intentions, there are emotions that fall far short of the glory of God, unless we have an extremely low view of who God is, mm -hmm. and an extremely low view of what his law actually requires. Now, if all we're looking is at superficial externals, then maybe we think we are going to get by, but in which, in this case, yeah, we need to hear a little more of the law and of why Jesus had to come and die for us in the first place. <laughs> But uh, to see the fruit of the Spirit, and this again is the, the point of the book of Galatians, mm. uh, we are not made perfect by the flesh, but by the hearing of faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and those that sow to the flesh, the natural processes by, whereby we think we can help God out, will of the flesh reap corruption. Those who sow to the Spirit, to the promise of the gospel, will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Uh, that passage is usually toned way out of context. It says, well, if you're a good, if you're a bad boy and do bad things, bad things will happen. But if you're a good boy and do good things, good things will happen. It's not even remotely what that's saying. It's contrasting helping God out with your own stuff versus saying, my own stuff stinks. God save me. I believe mm -hmm. in Jesus. Yeah. And the human heart is so prone to add to the gifts of God or to try and cling to our own perfection that even mm -hmm. things that are not not meant to be you know affronts to the glorious law of god can become that i was talking to a homeschool mom friend of mine um and she was saying that her son who's in high school was reading the resolutions of jonathan edwards oh. and which are just <laughs> you know maybe at the right time in the right place spiritually it's a wonderfully inspiring thing but for this kid he's like this guy is amazing and my life doesn't look like this at all and it was just so painful and browbeating for him mm. yeah that even this material that was supposed to be so devotional and inspiring and encouraging and uplifting and all this thing uh doesn't always go that way and so like we have to keep coming back to scripture and his promises, mm. God's promises that he presents to us there. And our private conversations with God are our private conversations with God. We don't need to share them with everybody mm. uh, because other people do not know our struggles, do not know where the landmines are in our own lives. And I, I would like to think, uh, Jonathan Edwards is not my favorite theologian for exactly that kind of reason, mm -hmm. some other 
things here and there. But giving him um, the bit, as you say, the benefit of the doubt, I doubt that he would want that handed to all young men with the <laughs> message, do all this in the end. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't think uh, he would have said that. No, no. And he was still growing at that point. When, when he was really young, he wrote an essay that said God and space are the same thing. <laughs> yes, he did. It's It found its way into one of my American literature oh, no. books. Oh, yeah, no. You know, space, space is omnipresent. God is omnipresent. There can't be oh. two omnipresents, so therefore space is God. Yeah, QED. Um, <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> uh, so, you yeah. uh, the, the know, the worst time to look into someone's spiritual life is when they're a teenager. <laughs> uh, on, only Jesus is worthy of examination in his teen years, and most of us even in our, oh, where are you, 30s, 20s, 40s, 60s, for me. I don't want people looking at my life and saying, Hey, we want to be just like you. Be like Jesus. Mm. Trust Jesus. You don't want you, you, even in wanting to be like Jesus. We want to be like Jesus because we love him, because he's wonderful, because he's the greatest ever. Not because we think that by being like Jesus, we're going to earn spiritual brownie points, or honestly think that in this life we're ever going to get there. Mm. Uh, we we mm -hmm. hang out with people we admire. We copy people we admire because they're admirable, and no one's more admirable than God in the flesh. Yeah, but we don't for a moment think we can do that. And it's I I just had this analogy pop into my head is the pro the one of the major problems with our mindset our way of viewing things is that when we think of our life and and how the Christian life is supposed to look, we always have this viewpoint biting at the back of our brain that you know these things are are meritorious for us. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there's simply not. Our our growth and sanctification is a wonderful thing. It's enabled by the Spirit. But I I get the feeling that most of us, when we when we think of Paul's exhortation to not let our faith become a shipwreck, we think of our faith as this beautiful golden galleon sailing across <laughs> the ocean surface. <laughs> when in reality, it's more like uh, that little dinghy that. Jack Sparrow <laughs> sails into the into the harbor in the first Pirates movie, as he as it sinks to the bottom of the bay and he steps off onto the dock. <laughs> yes, exactly. That is that is more like what it is by God's standard. If we're looking at it meritoriously, there's a reason Paul says that the law brings condemnation because we yeah. cannot measure up to it. The only reason our ship is sailing is because of the Spirit of God. And I think you you've. Put your finger on something that that I think I I missed, except maybe implicitly. When we distinguish faith and works, it's easy to think, well, so ignoring all works, now let's look at faith and see how cool our faith really is. <laughs> and we have faith just is not our the faith. one work that you do. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, that's sort of the Arminian approach to things. God has excused us from all other works. He now only requires one work one act of our will mm. that we trust in Jesus. And we, I think we tend to think oftentimes that our faith is actually pretty good. I've had to talk to a couple of young people in the last couple of months whose faith hasn't been all that good. They, as far as I can tell, they love Jesus. They're doctrinally sound, but they look at their faith and they say, my faith is so weak. It's, it kind of comes and goes. And some days I'm, I'm sure I believe in Jesus. And some days I just really am not. And, in one case, there's really good reason for the doubts, and the other, there may be, but I don't see them. But it, it, it's easy for some of us to just say, well, yeah, faith is faith. I got faith. Faith's really good. And then and then we can really get cool and say, because I can theologically talk about my faith. Hmm. Whereas others in the same mindset of treating faith as a work look at their look at their faith and are more honest hmm. and say, This is this is not cutting it. And so back to what Brian was saying, it is the sovereign work of the sovereign spirit and the quality, the, the, the um, effectiveness of our faith does not depend upon us. It does not depend, depend upon how strong and pure our faith is. Um, and what I am hoping to tell these young folks once COVID virus is gone and I can see them again, is <laughs> get your eyes off your faith, get your eyes on Jesus. Faith, though it be the size of a the grain of a mustard seed, it's not the quality of the faith; it's the reality and power of the one you trust in. Mm -hmm. The object and of the faith. The object of the faith, 
looking to Jesus. And I wish we could talk about this for literally ever. Um, and we will in heaven. <laughs> I'm super jazzed about that. But that is all the time that we have for tonight. So let's do some real quick recos and sign off. All right. Well, I'm going to recommend O. Palmer Robinson's book, Christ of the Covenants. Solid. Um, Brian is, yes, putting his thumbs up. <laughs> uh, I reread through a bunch of it to get ready for tonight. And the last time I read it, I was much, much younger, and, and I did not appreciate all the excellencies. He, his, his verbiage needs some polish, but in terms of content, <laughs> it is solid. You will, you will benefit mm -hmm. from it. And he addresses all kinds of things, but we didn't get anywhere near. Um, so O. Palmer Robertson, Christ of the Covenants. Hmm. He's actually the founding pastor of the church that we belong to at the moment. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess Brian, I'll, go, what do you got? I'll go next really quick. Um, mm -hmm. I actually just received this book in the mail today, and I'm extremely excited because it comes with the recommendations of Robert Lethem and Carl Truman, two of my... Ooh theological boys uh it is called <laughs> giving glory to the consubstantial trinity we need to start keeping a running list of all brian's theological boys <laughs> these are not the first two that you mentioned <laughs> that is a very good point i think i've mentioned, mentioned carl, carl once before, before. Okay. yeah maybe it was carl um, i do have several theological boys so it's okay uh but you, you should put them on a t-shirt just have a list <laughs> <laughs> it'll it'll be block like letters a, you know like, helvetica yeah, yeah. <laughs> As long as it's not uh, Comic Sans or Impact font, I'm yeah. fine. Uh, but yes, <laughs> it looks to be a fantastic... The subtitle says, An Essay on the Quintessence of the Christian Faith, and it is a discussion of the Trinity. I'm looking very forward to reading through this. It's also very short. It's roughly 120 pages. What's 100... the title again? I'm, I want uh, to get this. Giving Glory to the Consubstantial Trinity. Wonderful. Excellent. By Michael A. G. Haken. We will put those in the show notes. We will. They will. Actually, and they'll be Emily spelled will. correctly, too, <laughs> once I figure out how to do that. My recommendation is gardening. If you, like me, live yes. in an apartment and don't have a yard, get some potted plants. Um, <laughs> it's not really weird if you talk to them, just if you talk to them too loudly. <laughs> Or they start talking back. Yeah, when if my, they start talking <laughs> back, let us know. <laughs> when let my wife and I know. were first married, we had an apartment, and on the upper store balcony, we also created a garden in pots and carelessly referred to it as our pot garden. <laughs> oh, no. We got some raised eyebrows <laughs> over that one, but it was a wonderful thing. We, on the other hand, do have a backyard uh, for the last couple of days, my family and uh, extended family have been out there doing all kinds of work, and it is glorious. Oh, lovely. Yeah, lots, of, lots of roses and snapdragons and petunias, and we're getting in some veggies, so maybe we'll send you a picture. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. I would love it. We actually, um, we accidentally purchased some herbs the other day. <laughs> um I was just I was just expecting to get that. Wait, so like is this little... herbs euphemistically or like actual herbs? Actual herbs for cooking. <laughs> okay. And because uh, we were talking about pot gardens, so I had to clarify. That's, yeah, that's a good point. No, I did not accidentally purchase marijuana. And um, you know, I was like just expecting the little, you know, freshly cut strands of like rosemary and thyme. And instead they didn't have thyme, but my mom brought home rosemary and mint with little the roots still attached. So now we have both oh, of those yeah. sitting in the window for, for random usage in cooking. And I'm very excited. It's wonderful. Rosemary is amazing. I It's, it's my underrated. favorite herb. Yes. You can, you can quote the it's also Shepherd, my mother's Shepherd name, book. But... It's like, a man can make it from here to Judgment Day on uh, synthesized protein as long as he has a bit of rosemary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't right, think he's a real note. pastor, but amen to that. Well, yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for this conversation. Like I said, I wish we could keep talking about this for a real long time. But if you, our listeners, would like to get in on this conversation, you can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. You can like our Facebook page. Um, you can send us Facebook messages if you want. I suppose that is a possibility. You can check out our show notes and transcripts. Notes on how to find the show notes. <laughs> uh, this has been tricky lately. So... If you go to our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, and you're on your phone, 
they're not going to show up because you're on the mobile version of the website. You have to go to the full version of the website, which is sad but true. But you can find our show notes on our podcast catchers, like wherever you're getting our podcast. We will have the links in there. They're also on our Facebook posts when we post the new episodes. And they are on the full web version of the Anchor homepage. If you'd like to support us, one great way to do that is to buy books that we recommend. Um, the Amazon links, we get a little bit of kickback if you buy a book from Amazon through our links. Uh, you can support us monthly via Anchor, or you can give us a one-time gift with PayPal if you want to do that. That's paypal.me slash haltingtowardsion. You can leave us a review. Please email us. We'd love to hear from you. And thanks so much for listening. Hope to see you next week.